on the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Eleanor Oldroyd, sitting in this week for Alison Mitchell and I'm in a sunny London town where there is blue sky overhead, the daffodils are out, there's a bit of warmth in the air, spring is on the way and that fills my heart with joy because I just looked at my diary and I've worked out that three weeks today... The domestic cricket season gets underway. The county championship season will begin when no doubt there'll be snow and it'll be freezing cold. But uh, the cricket will be back in an English summer, which is one of my best times of the year, my favourite times of the year. But I am extremely lucky, of course, because I missed out on two months of the English winter by spending it in Australia with you, Jim Maxwell. Yes, Eleanor, and you had a wonderful time, um, apart from the cricket, I suppose, but... Maybe things are looking up a little bit for the English women in New Zealand. I can smell a an autumn gardenia just outside as you were going on about the flowers, but our cricket season's winding down other than our eyes on the events across the ditch in New Zealand and in Pakistan where we had a, a gripping draw uh, between Australia and Pakistan, a, a game Australia should have won, but... Um, of the Baba. He was bigger than the other Baba in making a, <laughs> a massive score and batting for 10 hours to save the game. Well, he is brilliant, isn't he? Eleanor, welcome to Stump, if I can uh, say that. Great to have you here. I'm actually uh, Charu Sharma for All India Radio in Madhya Pradesh, in the centre of India, in the city of Indore. This is a sort of a temple and a wildlife trip, so more on that much later. But we started all off. It's very hot, I must confess. Cricket-wise, while the Indian men have been... Uber overwhelming against Sri Lanka in Test Match Cricket at home. The women have sadly disappointed a bit up and down and allowing England a way into the World Cup. But hopefully they'll be a little more steady as they go along. We've got lots to catch up on, but we're going to start with the Women's Cricket World Cup where England have kept their hopes of retaining the trophy alive for now. They've lost against Australia, South Africa, West Indies, but they beat India by four wickets in their last match. Um, Jim, do you feel like this could be a turning point for England or has the damage already been done? Well, I hope it is a turning point because they're a better side than the one we saw in those other matches, but it hasn't quite clicked. There was some pretty ordinary fielding in one or two of those games and uh, they need their top players, Knight and Siver in particular, with the bat to to come off and they'll be competitive, but um, it becomes a bit of a crisis of confidence when you're losing even if uh, you've been in the game and have had a chance. So from here, I well remember what happened with Australia in uh, 1999 when they started badly and then won every match. So maybe England can do that and beat Australia in the final. That will be some result. (laughs) What have you made of England, Charu? And I I think, as Jim says, when you get into a losing habit, it's very difficult to shake it. And England, having come off the back of being, you know, not winning a game in, in the Ashes in Australia, and and then you just forget how to win, don't you? They also perhaps had the misfortune of playing all the best teams first up, and, you know, they they played three very tough teams, and I'm actually uh, not particularly happy that India allowed them back in, but um, they are back, and they're a very good team, as Jim has said, so I see no reason why against lesser opponents as they go along in the tournament, they can't win everything hereafter, but I think England's a much better team. I don't know why they started so badly, I'm not so sure whether the conditions didn't suit them or they were underprepared, but they are a much better team. And I don't know, there's good news. They'll win everything from now on. I'm, I'm, I'm certain of that. And, but, but from an India point of view, n- not to use up your overs in a game in a World Cup is, it's a bit unforgivable, isn't it, really? And being bowled out for 134, it just made it easier for England than, than they needed to. Yeah, I did, you know, I, I didn't see the, the Indian innings, unfortunately. I saw the English chase that very easily. I don't know whether there was something in the pitch or whatever. There's something in the newspapers about India throwing it away. I'm sure the English girls bowled very well uh, because the Indians had batted so well in the previous match. And they'd got tons as well. You know, 200s in a match, that's incredible. And then to go down for 134, inexplicable. I don't know what the problem was. Obviously, England bowled very well. But it was a struggle to ensure that you try and uh, keep England in check as much as possible because of that net run rate. Uh, that had massively helped India against the West Indies. But against England, uh, they are now in danger of having a, a lower run rate, which may eventually play an important part later on. So India, by losing big two uh, to England, have not done themselves any favour at all. 
It's been properly competitive, though, Jim, in lots of ways, hasn't it? And we and we have seen, you know, West Indies having moments of being really competitive. Um, New Zealand maybe won't have done enough. That England-New Zealand game on Sunday is effectively a knockout when it comes to, to the semi-finals, isn't it, really? That's going to be the, the game of the tournament so far. But apart from Australia, it, it just feels like, you know, it's been a little bit unpredictable, this World Cup. I've enjoyed watching South Africa play. Uh, they've had two outstanding wins, particularly the one as we are speaking here on this Thursday against New Zealand. And when, as you suggest, batting out overs, well, New Zealand didn't even do that. And it came down to the crunch uh, with a, a narrow win for South Africa. But they're a team genuinely on the improve. Uh, they're much better. Uh, Volvart is a, an extraordinarily good player. Uh, so I, I think I'd be keeping an eye on them as that as the kind of uh, a smoky potentially for the final. I, I'm, I have a feeling they're going to be in the semi-finals at least. What about Julian Goswami, uh, Charu? Because she made history this week by becoming the first ever female pace bowler to claim 250 wickets in one day cricket. What an achievement for her. Quite brilliant, and I believe there's a movie uh, soon to be made on her as well, which is the new sort of fad here in India. But why not? She's been playing for India for so long. A uh, bit of an odd figure in Indian cricket being very tall. And, uh, uh, of course, the 250 wickets just isn't uh, a tribute to what she's been able to achieve internationally. Always very tight, never gives too many runs away. Uh, has a very steady um, action coming in and, and a very good line as well, almost always keeps it outside off. So, you know, does all the basic things really well. And, uh, you know, I remember Bob Willis telling me a long time back, he said that for fast for any bowler, there was some sort of a tradition about trying to be under 25 as an average. And he was just over and he regretted that at the end of his career. But Julian at 21.9 or so under 22, it's also the fact that she's gotten all these wickets but given very little away. So, you know, top class performance. And you know, whether they, they admit it publicly or not, but people love such records, don't they? I mean, when they're playing for so long. So well done, Julian. You know, great performer, great soldier for India. From the BBC World Service, this is Stumped on All India Radio. Now, next on Stumped, Deandra Dottin, Harman Preet Kaur and Mignon Dupree are just some of the big names to sign up to a brand new women's cricket tournament featuring players from as many as 36 countries, including Bhutan, Vanuatu and Germany. The Fair Break Invitational is a women's T20 cricket tournament which will be played in Dubai and contested by six teams featuring world-renowned players. To tell us more, we're joined on Stumped by the founder of Fair Break and the man behind the tournament... Sean Martin. Hello, Sean. Hello, Eleanor. First and foremost, what is Fairbreak? Well, Fairbreak's a, an organisation that uh, concentrates on creating opportunity and equality, and we we use cricket as the as the vehicle for that. And it's been around for a long time. It's been a twelve year journey to to get to this point um, where we're at. So we've got some history, I think, in in what we do and how we do it. So what made you organise this tournament? Tell us the thinking behind this particular tournament. It sounds absolutely fascinating. Well, it goes back a long way to um, prior to the 2013 Women's World Cup. I, I did a lot of work with Lisa Stilaker for many years, wrote a book with her, which we launched in Mumbai, 2012. Um, and at the end of that tournament in 2013, when she retired, we, we set about creating what we call WICL in those days, Women's International Cricket League, with a view to having a, a global women's T20 tournament to advance the, the game um, and also to try and improve the the player remuneration and conditions around um, what was going on. We could see the increase in the quality of the play and also the viewer numbers uh, around the world and, and that prompted us to begin that. We were seen by some people as a, as a rebel group, which we weren't. We were just trying to, to um, grow the game and, and improve conditions and subsequently that morphed into what is now Fair Break. I've worked for seven years uh, to get approval from the ICC to to run this tournament. So there's never been a cricket tournament like it. There's never been 36 countries involved in, in one, I don't think any, to the best of my knowledge, any sporting event, a team sporting event outside of a, an Olympic Games. Jim Maxwell, Sean, nice to be talking Thank with you. you. Things have certainly evolved for uh, women's cricket. Uh, it's getting more exciting and um, pretty good to watch, which you couldn't say 10 or 15 years ago. So can you tell us more about some of the people involved because you have some 
huge SARS involved. Well, just from our own um, management team, we've got some interesting people. I mean, Jeff Lawson works on this with me full time and has for a number of years. Alex Blackwell's part of our management team. Sana Mir is part of our management team. Um, I suppose from 2018, we were putting fair break teams on on fields. We played at the first ever Sir Paul Getty Women's Eleven at Wormsley. Uh, we've done that every year up until COVID. Susie Bates has captained that team. Alex Blackwell has. Um, and that was really the format. That was an example of what you see in the tournament where we would blend some very uh, notable iconic players with these great associate nation players. So every time a fair break team has taken the field, it's been a squad of 12 or 14 women, usually from 10 or 12 countries. Um, but in this particular tournament, we've got a host of name players, um, you know, the Mignon Dupree's, the Marazan Caps, the Stefani Taylors, the Deandra Dottons, Susie Bates is playing, um, Sana Mir's coming out of retirement to captain one of the teams. So, you know, there's, there's 40 players of from full member board nations. Um, and I think you'll find in the tournament that some of the associate nation players that we've identified will probably be as big a names by the end of the tournament as some of the ones that are, you know, are notable in women's world cricket now. Yes, uh, you talked a bit about uh, the hidden diamonds in the other nations. Can you give us a bit more yeah. of a, a feel for that, about the opportunity and and perhaps some of the names from are these other places that uh, we wouldn't have heard of before? Um, yeah, well, the, the the other good aspect of this is it's the first time those Associate Nation players are fully contracted and paid. Um, so that's a significant uh, piece for a lot of them. It's actually life-changing for many of them in the countries that they live in. Uh, Anju Gurung from Bhutan, who you'll see, who bowls magnificent left-arm in-swingers, only plays men's cricket in her country. Um, and is, you know, I think will be a sensation. Uh, if they were playing not in associate nation countries, I believe they'd be playing for a full member board country. Hi, Sean. This is uh, Charu Sharma from All India Radio. Uh, congratulations to you and the entire team at Fairfield. It's going to be a fabulous journey, I have no doubt. And I look forward to watching it uh, somewhere or the other. I'm sure you got all that sewn up. Uh, and also yes. the standard from what you mentioned should be fabulous. The mix of world stars and those who may not be stars yet, but are obviously very good. Uh, you, you mentioned a little earlier that it took seven years, or did I catch that wrong, to get uh, permission from ICC. What has been the no. resistance like? Has it been really difficult to put together or did you get fabulous support from everyone? No, it's been very difficult to put together, to be honest with you. Um, and I think that comes from almost a perception of at the rebel nature or the um, disruptive nature, which is not a perception that we've ever encouraged or, or, or looked to entertain. But I think some of the, the concepts around what we do have been so different to what has been the established norm in, in cricket that sometimes that can be off-putting for people until they actually get a feel and an understanding for what you're doing. And I think that's just been a matter of time and persistence on our part so that we were able to demonstrate by putting uh, teams on the field in England and Australia that what we were doing was creating these opportunities and, and helping to grow, grow the game. There was nothing to fear from us. That's as much a, a matter of awareness uh, as, as anything else. We have a pure sport ethos. Our playing kit is all made out of recycled plastic, so we have a sustainability uh, piece around what we do. So we've we've been a bit different in in the way we've approached the game and 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 how we see opportunity. And that and that drives a whole other level of investment and and op, uh, and uh, an interest from from brands who are, are linked to those ideals that we have. Sean, it sounds like you've got some fascinating uh, ideas there, and I'm sure that the rest of the world will watch with great interest what you're doing as well, because it's um, it's it's a whole new ball game, as they say. Um, but it's cricket essentially, and that's what we love. And and I love so, the idea that you're, you're trying to grow the global game in a very literal sense. Um, Sean Martin, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Sean is the organizer of the Fair Break tournament, which will be taking place in Dubai. Now, let's wrap up Stumped today by talking about some extraordinary test match cricket that's been going on in the men's game around the world. Um, Jim, let's start with that extraordinary, that amazing test match between Pakistan and Australia in Karachi. 
uh, Australia 556 for nine declared. Then Pakistan bowled out 148, so 400 runs behind. Australia didn't enforce the follow-on. They declared, but still set Pakistan a huge target to, to win it or to save the game. And they saved the game. And Baba Azam was the star of, of that with 196 in his second innings. But will Australia rue those missed opportunities or will they just take their hats off to the way that Pakistan played in that second innings? Oh, they certainly take their hats off, particularly to Baba Azam for playing such a, an extraordinary innings. I think the uh, interesting part of this match was the way that uh, Pakistan, unlike perhaps sometimes in the past, they showed a bit more resolve. The, the word collapse and the word Pakistan is synonymous quite often in the history of cricket. No one can collapse as well as Pakistan. And we saw that in the first innings on a good pitch. Yes, Australia got a bit of reverse and it all happened in a hurry. And I well understand why Cummins didn't enforce the follow-on. They'd only batted for 53 overs. But there was so much time left. Uh, with that attack, if you can't get a team out, something's gone amiss. And Australia could argue that, yes, they missed some chances. And just the attitude, resolve, the skill of Baba Azam in occupying the crease for so long thwarted Australia. Um, but it was engrossing viewing, I have to say. So, look, well done, Pakistan, for getting out of it. And Lahore could be even tougher than these mm -hmm. two tests to get a result. Uh, and we may well get three draws, which takes us back to India playing Pakistan in the 1950s, where there were lots of draws on very flat pitches, and the pitches are pretty flat. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Stumped on All India Radio. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter. We are at BBC WS Sport and use the hashtag BBC Stumped. My thanks to Charu Sharma, Jim Maxwell and to all of you for listening. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Stumped is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service in association with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and All India Radio.